Thanks, Donna. Um, I uh, appreciate the invitation. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Donna instructed me to keep my talk under five hours, so I'm going to do my best uh, to stick to that. Um, I um, am not a resident of the Catskills uh, or the Catskill Park any longer, but I used to be. Um, my time there um, ran from 1998 to 2007 when I worked at the Catskill Center for Conservation and Development. Um, now I live back in the Finger Lakes region where I grew up, um, but my heart uh, remains in the Catskills always, and it's a place that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and um, let's, should we try the screen share here, Don, and see if I can get my presentation out? I think I set it up on my end, so just try and see. Uh, oh, gotcha, uh, let's see. There we go. Uh, can people see the first slide? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, when I was um, at the Catskill Center, um, I did a lot of work in land conservation and natural resources and was involved in Catskill Park issues um, and uh, certainly was a hiker and myself and fly fisher and hunter and spent a lot of time in the outdoors. Um, and during that time, uh, me and many others kind of realized around 2002 that a couple years away was going to be the 100 year anniversary of the Casco Park in 2004. And um, I see Helen Chase is on. She was instrumental in that group of people um, that kind of brainstormed ideas for things to do uh, to commemorate that anniversary. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later in my talk. Um, but one of the things that um, I spent the most time on and that came out of that anniversary process was a book about the Catskill Park. Um, and um, I, I knew a guy named Norm Van Volkenberg who was a retired employee of the New York State DEC. He uh, was from the Catskills, grew up in West Kill Valley and um, started off as a surveyor and rose up in the ranks to be a director of the Division of Lands and Forest. Um, but significantly, he was also an historian of the Catskill Forest Preserve, the Adirondack Forest Preserve, the parks, other categories of state lands. He just knew and wrote and researched a ton about the history of the state's acquisition and management of lands for conservation purposes. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this writing that Norm had in this, you know, this valuable information was buried in some newsletter articles uh, for the Catskill Center's newsletter, the Conservationist Magazine. And um, interestingly, in the basement of the Caskill Center, I found a box of books that was this um, very thorough history of state land acquisition by Norm, um, but it was kind of dense typeface uh, text with no pictures and it was not circulated to the public. It was just kind of um, this, this book that no one had. And so um, what we did was decide to team up and dust off all this great information uh, bring it up to date to 2004 for the anniversary, add some sections about how the park is managed and why it's unique and important. And um, I probably most importantly splash in a whole bunch of great pictures of the Catskill Park, both color photography uh, contributed by photographers like uh, Thomas Teich and Francis Driscoll and Mark Carroll, um, but also a lot of fantastic old black and white photos and old postcards from collections in town museums um, and historical societies, but also uh, individuals who had great collections and they were so generous to give us these images. And I've sprinkled a number of them throughout this presentation in addition to in the book. Um, so where is the Catskill Park? Um, you probably all know, uh, you may even be sitting inside of it. Um, it's in southeastern New York, straddling the towns, or sorry, excuse me, the counties of Delaware, Sullivan, Green, and Delaware. Um, zoom in a little more, you can see some of the towns and villages that are inside the park and just outside the park. 
We're talking about the area, the mountains just uh, west of the Hudson River, and southwest of Albany, uh, going down to the Delaware River to the southwest. And um, this is the kind of the current state map of the Catskill Park and Forest Preserve. Uh, it's a little hard to see probably, but there's a faint blue line that is the Catskill Park boundary. Um, and within that, um, and without, but mostly within, there is a big uh, concentration of green, which is uh, the forest preserve lands, all the public lands that are protected and open to the public. And there's a couple different shades of colors there. The dark green in our wilderness areas. The lighter green is wild forest, which is a different cast classification, but still uh, part of the forest preserve. There are also some intensive use areas. I'm gonna talk more about these later. Uh, intensive use is things like the Beller ski area and the campgrounds. Um, and then you also make out uh, purple parcels, which are New York City watershed <laughs> conservation lands. Um, and I'm gonna mention those later as well. Uh, but this is where the park is and you can kind of see um, one of the main differences between the Catskill Park and the Adirondack Park and any other park in our country um, or most state parks are that it's not just one big contiguous block of land. You don't go into an entrance booth and um, enter the park in an obvious way where you're surrounded by all public land. This is a patchwork mosaic of public and private land. You can see on this map just how interspersed the public lands are from all the private properties that are intermixed. Um, and this is a great um, unique feature of the Adirondack and Catskill parks. Um, so just to kind of go through a little more about what makes the Catskill park so special and unique. Um, first of all, this is America's first wilderness. Um, all of America was wilderness at one time, but when European settlers, explorers came to this continent um, and met the natives that were here and began exploring for the first time themselves. The first place they saw that was mountainous and rugged and had a wilderness character was the Catskill Mountain. When Henry Hudson sailed the Half Moon up the Hudson River, this mountain backdrop was what he saw and what was kind of awing for him and other explorers. And this is kind of the wilderness that the settlers faced when they began, you know, settling the Hudson Valley, um, you know, clearing land for towns and communities and farmland. Um, Wallace Stegner stated that wilderness was the challenge against which our character as a people was formed. And the Catskills were right there at the beginning, the first place they faced. Um, it's also a wilderness in incredibly close proximity to millions of people. We're talking about two to three hours from New York City, Manhattan, and all the metropolitan areas around there. Um, you know, it's so easy to jump in a car, leave, drive over the George Washington Bridge, and be at the Slide Mountain Trailhead uh, within a couple of hours, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and then that creates opportunities and pressures. Um, but this is definitely an accessible wilderness. Um, it's, I'm going to go into this quite a bit in my coming slides, but this was a wilderness lost and a wilderness recovered. These mountains were not protected in a pristine state. Um, they were stripped clear of so much timber and bluestone and hemlock bark and all kinds of extractive industries. Fires ravaged the mountainsides. Um, and what we see today is, except for some areas that were um, mostly untouched, which I'll also mention later, um, most of this was cut over, burned over, and then recovered. And it's, it's really remarkable to walk into a mature forest um, in the lower slopes of the Catskills today and think that it was basically level at one time. Um, as I mentioned in the previous map, um, it's a mix of public and private land, all interspersed and intertwined. Um, it's completely remarkable that all this forest preserve is intermixed with communities, people that live in the park 
surrounded by nature, um, in close proximity to all these forest preserve lands. Um, it also means that the forest preserve lands, which is an example of preservation where the timber is not managed, the trees are left, uh, nature is left alone to its own designs, the forest can become old growth, can be right next to a forest that's owned by a private owner who can be doing active forest management and, and, and taking timber. So it's um, that results in landscape diversity, which um, is a benefit to all kinds of wildlife to have different types of land cover across the region, across the landscape. Um, I've been talking a lot about, about wilderness, but there in the Catskills, there are different classified classifications of state land. Um, we have the wilderness areas where man is a visitor, where nature is left to its own course and the um, constructions of mankind are at a minimum. We have basically a few hiking trails and some designated campsites and maybe some lean-tos and by and large, it's large tracts left alone. Whereas there's other areas with more intensive recreation. Um, and I'll talk more about this as well. Uh, the ecosystem services provided by these mountains are unfathomable and you just can't put a value. The water supply alone, which um, provides water to New York City and many other downstate communities is worth billions of dollars. Um, there's a, you know, you could spend hours just talking about the New York City water supply history in the reservoirs, um, and we'll we'll touch on that a little bit more as we go. But um, the the rivers that provide clean water coming from the forests, coming from the mountains, is um, worth so much. The forests themselves, vast tracts of forest, provide clean air and help mitigate climate. Um, there are so many different types of wildlife habitat and extensive areas of wildlife habitat that that's just a huge uh, service that these mountains provide. And um, the economic driver that these mountains provide to all the communities in and around the Catskill Park. Um, everything from leaf peepers and hikers to uh, you know, folks who stay at hotels and lodges um, to the ski areas and everything in between. Um, and another thing that you know really is important to me is just how the beauty of the Catskills is different than other places and special. Um, you know, I, I love going to places like uh, the Yosemite Valley and the Grand Canyon um, and even the Adirondack High Peaks where the grandeur of the place just kind of knocks you over and takes your breath away. The Catskills are different. They're a little more subtle, but they're so intensely beautiful in a more close way. You drive, you get off the state highways and take the back roads through the beautiful farms. And then you step out onto a trail and you see this, the crystal clear streams, the bedrock ledges, um, waterfalls. And it's just a beauty that will, uh, as I say in the book, creep into your bones and stay there forever. Um, so when we think of the Catskills, a lot of times what comes to mind first is just this grand, beautiful landscape with mountains and scenic vistas, lakes and ponds. Um, you zoom in a little bit, you step out onto that trail or walk up a stream with your fly rod, and you're going to see these emerald pools and waterfalls, um, bluestone ledges, rock outcrops, all of which supports incredibly important native plants, which form a number of different habitat types from old growth forests to flies and bogs and spring seeps. Uh, um, and everything uh, supporting um, an incredible diversity of plant life. Um, all that habitat is important for the wild animals that live in these mountains from bear to bobcat to bald eagles, beavers and barred owls and more. We think of hiking, camping, Boating, other recreational pursuits like bike riding, swimming, tubing, ice climbing, 
certainly fishing is huge in the Catskills from our uh, beloved trout streams and the rich heritage of fly fishing, uh, you know, the birthplace of American fly fishing to the reservoirs that uh, New York City created um, to some of the ponds. Hunting as well. And certainly there are uh, a rich history of farming in the region um, within and without the Catskill Park. Um, certainly that is not quite as um, prevalent as it was in years past with fewer farms today than there were say 100 years ago. Um, but there are still plenty of uh, important fa farmers and farmland in and around the park. We think of industries, uh, everything from the railroads to the sawmills and the bluestone quarries. Certainly the era of the grand hotels comes to mind when we think of the Casco Park. Are my slides updating fast enough for you all to see them? Yes, we can see them. Okay, great. Uh, and as I mentioned, communities are what make the Casco Park unique. It's not just a, a big tract of public land. It's not just a park uh, with only undeveloped land. It's also a place where people live and where um, community life is uh, ongoing every year in different places throughout the region. Um, and it's just uh, a way to enjoy a place where upstate New Yorkers enjoy a rural lifestyle. So a little bit about the history of the Catskill Park and Forest Preserve. Um, this all got going really in the, the story begins in the Revolutionary War when New York found itself um, the owner of 7 million acres of land that was turned over from England in the act of attainder. Um, almost all that was in the Adirondacks and the Catskills, most of the large land grants had occurred long before then. Um, the biggest being a million and a half acres to Johannes Hardenberg in 1708. Um, and then over the next year, the state made rapid work of getting rid of those lands. They didn't want to own them. They wanted this land to be settled, to be um, turned into profitable use. Uh, so large tracts went to settlers, to railroad companies, to lumber mills. Um, and there was, you know, incredible amount of resource extraction to build our young nation going on throughout New York and New England and the East Coast and certainly in the Adirondacks and Catskills. Um, part of that was environmental degradation occurring at a grand scale. There really was no thought of, you know, the future um, and of protecting the quality of the streams or the quality of the future forests. And so, you know, there was great destruction of the landscape um, in the course of those extractive industries. And that, you know, occurred unabated for, you know, 50, 60, 70 years before a counter movement began to emerge in the mid to late 1800s, especially. And um, that really was um, brought forth, especially by artists and writers, um, the artists being the Hudson River School painters, uh, Thomas Cole, Frederick Church, Sanford Gifford, Jasper Cropsey, Asher Durand. They created these incredible paintings many times of the Catskills, of these scenes that were just magnificent. Um, not always accurate, sometimes romanticized, um, but they just gave people a sense of, of incredible beauty of nature. Um, writers like Henry David Thoreau and Walt Whitman extolled the virtues of nature but it wasn't just people um, from New England anywhere. It was also writers in the Catskills. Um, James Fenimore Cooper with his adventure stories of wilderness. And of course, our beloved local John Burroughs who wrote all about nature in many, many essays. Um, he, they, those people and others brought nature into people's homes and gave people an appreciation. Um, people also started you know, leaving the city to go to the country to 
stay in these hotels that were beginning to emerge and spend time in fresh air away from the smog and hustle and bustle of the city. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the fly fishing history really got going and um, people took notice of the quality of the rivers and the importance of clean water. Um, it wasn't just sportsmen and romantic writers and painters, though. There was also a business interest in this as well that was very powerful. New York is connected to the rest of the world, not just by the ocean, but also by the Erie Canal at that time. Businesses in Albany and Schenectady depended on the canal and water flowing into the canal from rivers in the mountains was dwindling as the forests were cut down and fires ravaged the landscape. Um, the water supply went way down. And so they, there was definitely a clamor for protection of forests, um, not just for the sake of the forests and the rivers and the recreation and the beauty, but for the economic importance they provide. Um, so in the, excuse me, one second. There we go. Uh, in the 1880s, um, the state finally stopped selling off all the lands that it was trying to dispose of and um, were convinced that they should hold on to these lands and perhaps even use them to create a park or forest preserve of some kind, um, particularly in the Adirondacks. The Catskills were often discussed, but usually dismissed as not being important enough of a place or being too um, uh, damaged already to be worth protecting. Um, a commission was set up to study this idea of forest preservation. And um, at the same time, a lot of lands were being abandoned by the railroad companies and lumber companies and farmers who could not make a living or cut everything out and nothing was left of value. And so instead of continuing to pay taxes, they let these lands go for back taxes. And it was easier just to uh, you buy the land, take what you could and then abandon it and not pay the taxes anymore. So the state and the counties were beginning to own more land from tax sales or tax foreclosures. Um, so the, the commission that was studying the forest preserve, studying the idea of creating a forest preserve was gonna take all these lands, make, make them into state ownership and uh, create a park. Um, and they were even talking about um, the state paying taxes on those lands to the communities that they fell in and this really caught the attention of Cornelius Hardenberg from Ulster County. He was a um, county assemblyman um, or legislator and uh, in the 1800s, and he hated taxes of all kinds, but especially hated the idea that whenever these lands would end up in the county's ownership because people abandoned them and they were foreclosed on, that the county would then owe taxes on those lands to the state. The state was going to tax these lands against the county. The county would owe money to the state, and that made him furious. What resulted was an epic battle between Cornelius Hardenberg and the state comptroller, a couple state comptrollers, um, but the, the main one being uh, Chapin, um, a man named Chapin. So, something like 10 different laws were passed back and forth, back and forth, where Chapin would um, make sure that all the counties knew that they were being taxed on any of the lands that they owned. And then Cornelius Hardenberg would pass a law saying, that's fine, but Ulster County is exempt. And then Chapin would change the law, removing the exemption. And then Cornelius would change the law back again, saying somehow or other, Ulster County is exempt again. We're not gonna pay taxes. And this went back and forth and back and forth. It was a slugfest um, from a legal standpoint over taxation. And in 1885, when um, it became clear that a forest preserve was about to be created and that the state would pay the taxes to the communities on those lands, Cornelius Hardenberg, um, did a last minute political or legal maneuver to get 
four Catskill counties inserted into the bill. It was originally only going to be the Adirondacks, but he added these four counties and it went through and passed. And so in 1885, the law that created the forest preserve in New York was not just the Adirondack Forest Preserve, but both the Catskills and the Adirondacks. And not only did the county not have to pay taxes anymore on these lands, but it was being paid now by the state on these same lands. It was a major coup for Cornelius Hardenberg, and it's what created the forest preserve in the Catskills. Um, the, the Catskill Forest Preserve started out with just about 34,000 acres. Um, and uh, shortly thereafter, um, the state wanted to know just what it had in the Catskills. And so the commission, there's a forest commission that was also designated by the law that created the forest preserve. Um, the commission sent um, a man named Charles Carpenter into the Catskill region to create a thorough um, review of, of what the Catskills were and what the problems were and what the opportunities were. And he came back with a 51 page report and that entire report is very interesting. It's an appendix in the book. You can read the whole thing. Um, but I do want to take a few minutes to read some excerpts from it because they're kind of illuminating, I think, and um, give a good sense of the history of the Catskills in 1886. The Catskill region abounds in streams of large volume and rapid descent, furnishing power to a large number of manufacturing concerns which draw their raw material from the forests which clothe the mountains. A continuation of these industries depends to a large extent on the continuance of the water supply, and that in turn depends upon a judicious, a judicious management of the forests, of keeping out fires and allowing sections as have been cut over to grow up with a new forest covering. The forests of the Catskills originally were made up of the same mixture of hard and soft timber as is found in undisturbed sections of the Adirondack wilderness. The original pine was cut out so many years ago that the memory of the generation of our fathers cannot recall when it was done. No doubt the earliest settlers, away back in the first years of the last century, are responsible for the disappearance of this kind of timber. There is some spruce still to be found in the Catskills. There is also a limited supply of hemlock. The largest part of the supply of tan bark is shipped from the towns, and it is on this limited supply that the few tanneries now doing business are dependent. 30 years ago, this Catskill region was in places a dense hemlock wilderness, and the business of tanning was the leading industry. But the avarice of the tanners got ahead of their judgment, and the timber was slaughtered for the bark alone. The peeling progressed much faster than the sawing till the woods became filled with the dry trunks and drier tops. And then the fire caught in these old peelings and the old story of total denudation was repeated with more or less disastrous results. Many localities show these fire scars. Some are recovering slowly, but still a young and hardy timber growth is there, which in time will grow into a tall forest. Some places have never recovered from the effect of fire and never will for the soil that sustains the life of the tree has been consumed or washed away. A steep mountainside once deprived of the mass of clinging roots, moss, and leaf mold with a network of branches or a canopy of leaves to break the force of driving rainstorms is shorn of its power to withstand this force of nature and the loose masses of earth overlaying in many instances only to a shallow depth the smooth faces of the rock become detached and are washed into the streams threading the valleys below and are carried away. A thousand years will not reclothe these denuded mountainsides with forests. The reckless waste of mountain forests is plainly visible in the whole Casco region, no matter from which side it is viewed, and this is not a thing of the past. The reckless waste is going on all the time, and the noble forests mowed down to satisfy the cupidity of man, with no thought of replacing them and no provision for their regrowth, which implies the abandonment at no distant day of important industries. It would be well for the men who conduct these industries to think ahead a little and observe if they cannot see the end in the near future and provide against it in a way that hard experience has taught people of older nations. Carpenter goes on, this region forms the natural picnic ground of the vast populations of New York City and vicinity. For that reason alone, in as much as it brings health and vigor to replace wasted vitality to the thousands who seek the pure air of its mountains and the sparkling water to its living springs, 
part of this region at least, should be left in as near a state of nature as at this late day is possible. There came at times uneasy minds and roving spirits who explored for the sake of finding something new. Gradually, the beauties of this whole region became known and were written about, till finally every valley, many of the mountains, and the desirable places generally became more or less known and finally occupied by a people who make it their business to care for the multitudes who annually swarm to this region for three or four months and leave it desolate for nine. The fine fishing afforded by the many mountain streams attracts another class of people who come to this region as early as the 1st of May, but whose stay is very brief. Its proximity to New York makes it an easy matter for the city sportsmen to leave business for a few days to angle for the trout in the clear waters of the streams. So common became this practice that the natural increase of the fish could not keep pace with the rate they were taken out, so that artificial stocking of the streams had to be resorted to. And the leasing of streams has diminished the amount of public waters. Consequently, these are left free and are fished to death the first week at the opening of the season and kept in that condition by the army of hungry sportsmen who come later. Hunting in this region is confined chiefly to grouse, rabbits, squirrels, and such small game. Deer are rarely seen and much more rarely killed. The cupidity of a few men has caused the deer to become nearly extinct in this region. The last of the deer were killed off some 12 years ago when pot hunters came into this region, presumably from Pennsylvania, and killed a large numbers of deer from which the hides were taken and the carcasses left to rot in the woods. Since that time, the hunters have been able to keep pace with the natural increase of the few that were left from the wholesale slaughter. It is fair to suppose that there are not a dozen deer in this whole Catskill region, though the natural features are such as to provide all the requirements for an abundant increase if they were protected and left unmolested to roam the woods at their own sweet will for a few years. In the early times, the Dutch settler hunted wild turkeys along the beach ridges, but there have probably been no wild turkeys in this region or any other part of it for nearly a hundred years, and it is doubtful whether the conditions are such that they could ever be induced to thrive again in the thin open woods that occupy the places of the then dense forests. And last, there is rarely found in the Casco region an abandoned farmstead, which in itself is good evidence that a continuous cultivation does not exhaust the soil and that the farms are productive enough of wealth. This distinguishes this wild region from the similar one in the Adirondacks, where deserted homesteads are met at frequent intervals and in places the dilapidated remains of whole villages. The Catskill region as a whole has a good soil and a friendly climate, which the Adirondacks can scarcely be said to possess. Um, so usually when things happen related to the Catskills and Adirondacks, the forest preserve, it happens first in the Adirondacks and later maybe in the Catskills. One exception though, where the Catskills came first um, was in 1892 when uh, the state um, appropriated the first money to build a public trail on state lands. And this was a trail up to the top of Slide Mountain. Now there are nearly 350 miles of trails throughout the Catskill Park. Um, the problem with the creation of the Forest Preserve in 1885 was that um, it did not stop all abuses from occurring. Um, the people of the state began growing quite angry over the continuation of some problems that were still persisting, such as um, exchanging and sales of some of the smaller parcels of land by the state, leases for camps, get big giveaways to railroads, uh, road building um, all, all over the mountainous areas, and, and still timbering. Um, and uh, this led to um, a clamor for better protection of the forest preserve in the Adirondacks and Catskills. And the way to do that, um, as determined by the politicians and attorneys at the time, was to give it constitutional protection. And so in 1894, there was a constitutional convention. They considered um, proposals for, for protection of the forest preserve. They were put before the voters in November of that year and passed. And so now, and forever, forevermore since then, up till now, we have 
constitutional protection of the state forest preserve. And it reads, the lands of the state now owned or hereafter acquired constituting the forest preserve as now fixed by law shall be forever kept as wild forest lands. They shall not be leased, sold or exchanged or be taken by any corporation, public or private, nor shall the timber thereon be sold, removed or destroyed. Um, this is important because it basically creates um, a preservation, a preserved forest um, on most of these lands. Um, and to go against that very basic um, protection, statement of protection, to, to minimize that or make exceptions to that takes an amendment to the Constitution, which is not easy. To amend the Constitution, you have to have two consecutive approvals by the state legislature and then approved for the vote by the people. Um, more than 2000 amendments have been um, introduced to the legislature in the time, um, actually maybe more, this, this is accurate in 2004, so it's possible <laughs> it has been more, um, but uh, more than 2000 um, have been introduced only 29 have been presented to the people for a vote and only 20 approved and passed by law. <clears throat> so it's a pretty uh, effective and meaningful protection for the forest preserve. And it really, you know, consider how long ago this was. Um, this is really setting up um, the first real protected wilderness in the United States. Um, Yellowstone, I believe, predated this, um, Niagara Falls, but those were kind of parks that also had you know, problems in the early years. Uh, this is the first real constitutionally protected wilderness. <clears throat> uh, in 1899 was a milestone because now um, the state was actually going to go out and buy more land to add to the forest preserve. So at first it was giving away land, then it stopped, created the forest preserve with what it had, and now it was going to begin adding back. Um, the first appropriation was $50,000 in that year, another $50,000 a year later. <clears throat> in 1904, we have the creation of the Catskill Park. Um, you would think this might be a lofty uh, goal with a lot of fanfare, um, you know, big announcements about establishing this park, um, but it really was not the same as creating the Forest Preserve. The boundary of the park, this blue line that we refer to, was really just a way for the state to focus those land acquisitions that it was now going to start doing. It wanted to know where should we put our efforts in acquiring more land. And so essentially they wanted to fill in gaps within this area. It's a very odd shaped area. How it was first determined is um, anybody's guess. Um, a lot of old lot lines um, and some rivers, um, but it's, it's certainly an odd shape. Um, and also it created um, a sort of a problem that was debated for decades after, what do you do with those forest preserve lands that are now outside of that boundary? These are called detached forest preserve lands because they're in the forest preserve counties that the law set up as forest preserve, but they're not any, they're not any longer within this blue line. Um, and it also raised the question of, well, how much land should the state try to acquire within this blue line? Should it, is the goal to require everything and make it a big solid park? Uh, but certainly most people discounted that as totally unrealistic given that there are whole communities, not to mention other types of private lands in this area. Um, 1905, we get the first official state forest fire tower lookout um, on Balsam Lake Mountain, which replaced um, a lookout tower that was privately uh, put up on that mountain by the Balsam Lake Club in the 1800s. Uh, and then others showed up soon after on Bel Air and Hunter, Slide, Tremper, Red Hill. The state took very seriously um, uh, forest fire control. Um, and the sooner you could spot a forest fire, the sooner it could be put out before it could cause a lot of destruction. Um, so this was an important investment by the state. And um, a lot of these towers um, stood the test of time. 
um, and are remain on mountaintops. Uh, some very crude old ones were uh, in the past made of wood, uh, but then they were made of metal and lasted a lot longer. Uh, when I was at the Catskill Center in the early 2000s, my coworker Helen Budrock um, coordinated a project among the Catskill Center, the New York State DEC, and other stakeholders and partners and funders to restore the five fire towers in the Catskills remaining at that time um, to a condition where they could be used by the public. Most of them were uh, fenced off um, and considered not safe for anyone to go up inside. Um, but after that project finished, all five towers were uh, improved, restored, and now people can go up uh, into the cabs when they're open or at least to the top steps when the cabs are closed and get incredible 360 degree views um, of the Catskill Mountains, which is important here because unlike the Adirondacks, we don't have any mountaintops that are above tree line. So to have um, these, these incredible spots where you can get views in every direction is a great resource. Um, if you hike to all five of those towers, plus the newest sixth one that was built at the Capitol, uh, excuse me, the Catskill Interpretive Center in Tramp, Mount Tremper, you can get a patch. Um, back to the history, uh, the Catskill and Adirondack parks were originally kind of considered just the state lands within that blue line. But in 1912, they changed the definition so that all the land within that blue line would be considered in the park. It didn't really mean anything in terms of how those private lands were managed. There were no um, real differences as to why uh, as, as to how a private land inside the park differed from private land outside, um, but that would change in the future, which I'll get to later. Um, 1916, we started seeing uh, much more meaningful allocations of money for purchasing additional forest preserve lands. Seven and a half million dollars at that time was a lot of money. 49,000 acres were acquired in the Catskill Park. Um, including huge tracks on some of the most notable mountains. Um, another Bond Act, uh, just eight years later, 1924, um, generated enough money to acquire 72,000 acres of land. Average price at that time, $10 an acre. Um, in that time, the state picked up uh, most of the land around the Catskill Mountain House, which is an iconic location with a view out over the Catskills Escarpment to the Hudson Valley um, and North Lake, um, which we now call North South Lake. Uh, the state campgrounds began to be funded and created, uh, first in Devil's Tombstone, uh, in, in uh, Stony Clove, and then in Woodland Valley, or at the same year, and then Beaverkill and North Lake after. Um, in 1947, I mentioned that there was a constitutional amendment to create the Bel Air Ski Area. That, uh, that happened then. Um, and then in 1957, the Catskill Park boundary was changed um, the one and only time it was ever revised. Um, there was talk of revising it at other points in the future, but it didn't happen. So this is the current boundary of the Catskill Park. Um, it was proposed to expand it much more than what's shown on this map. There were proposals to include much bigger areas to the Northwest, especially in Delaware County um, and to the Southwest. Um, but in the end, um, it was relatively minor adjustments um, along Sliver on the Southwest in Sullivan County and Delaware County, uh, bumping it out to the North side of the Papacton. And then the biggest change was um, extending it in the east around the Ashokan Reservoir and encompassing the forest preserve, the detached forest preserve lands um, in the Bluestone area just outside of Kingston. Uh, more money came in the 60s from Bond Acts. Um, 12,000 acres were acquired in the Catskills. And what's really interesting to me on this slide is that in the 40 years between the 1920s and the 19, early 1960s, the land value, the average price for land went from $10 to only $37 in 40 years. But then in the 10 years from 1962 to 1972, the land value went from $37 an acre to $400 an acre. 
So a huge jump in that 10 years. Um, more state campgrounds came around in the 60s, Mongol Pond, Little Pond. Um, the, uh, the one thing that separates private land inside the Catskill Park from private land outside the Catskill Park um, was established in 1969. And that is a sign law um, that basically said there was a limit or a restriction or prohibition on certain types or sizes of signs advertising businesses on private lands. You can't have billboards wherever you want. And um, unfortunately, uh, we still have plenty of billboards in the Catskill Park. They were grandfathered in, and um, it's also possible that this law is not very well enforced and signs pop up uh, that shouldn't over time. Um, but that is the that remains on the books the only difference between private land inside the park and outside the park. That's vastly different than in the Adirondacks where private lands are limited and zoned by the Adirondack Park Agency, which came around in the 70s, which did not happen in the Catskills. Uh, but that's also another whole story. Um, in 72, the Bond Act that, um, that generated 15 million to buy land in the Catskill Park um, allowed the state to pick up 35,000 more acres. This is kind of the end of the era of big tracks um, for the most part um, and, and huge areas being protected. Um, the biggest single acquisition at that time was 3,600 acres in the headwaters of the Beaver, Beaver Kill River, um, which was originally owned by the Balsam Lake Mountain Club, uh, the Fly Fishing Club, and went to the Catskill Center for Conservation and Development uh, who had originally intended to keep it as a managed preserve, um, but they had trouble with tax exemption from the town and it ended up going to the state uh, since the state had pays taxes to the towns. Um, I'll show you a map of that in a minute. Um, there was also a temporary study commission to study the Catskills, and this was a big deal. Um, yet another commission, but the first in a long time. Um, and they were not just looking at the Catskill Park and Forest Preserve, they were looking at the whole region and economic development and, and um, you know, obstacles and opportunities faced by the people of the region. Uh, but they did look um, at the Catskill Park and the Forest Preserve too, and they proposed that not all Forest Preserve lands are created equal, and the state should um, create a classification system for the different forest preserve tracks. Um, they also said that the state should continue to keep acquiring land to add to the forest preserve. Um, and we'll see where that goes in a minute. Uh, one last campground, Kenneth Wilson State Campground between Mount Tremper and Overlook was created in 1979. Um, in 1985 is when uh, some of the recommendations from that temporary study commission in the 70s finally came to fruition with the adoption of a Catskill Park State Land Master Plan. And this now set forth um, a classification system for the forest preserve lands. Some big tracks would be wilderness, places where man is a visitor, nature is left to its own course, and the constructions of man are, are very, very limited. Um, Contrast that with wild forest lands, which are a little more, um, they're still not managed timber or anything like that. It's still a uh, preserved forest land. However, a greater array of recreational uses such as snowmobile trails and the fire towers can occur on these lands. Um, and then a handful of intensive use areas where there's gonna be much more uh, development of recreational resources for visitors. These are the campgrounds with the buildings and the you know, fire pits and the things that go with the campgrounds, you know, the, the water lines that people need to, to stay at a campground and latrines. Um, it's also the Bel Air ski area. Um, and then, you know, since that time, uh, every one of these different units of forest preserve land has its own separate management plan, you know, that says, where is the state going to put in a parking area? Where is it going to build a trail? You know, what are the specifics for that piece of property? And those are all um, presented to the public for review and input. Um, 
more Bond Act money comes in 1986. Um, now, instead of tens of thousands of acres, we're picking up, you know, uh, only 3,500 acres. Um, and the price has now jumped to over $1,000 per acre. Um, the, uh, the guidance for land acquisition um, changed a little bit in 1992. Now, instead of the state just kind of um, deciding on its own where to buy land, um, it would take in the advice of stakeholders from around the state. And they did this through the open space plan process. Uh, so the open space plan is updated every three years and um, a variety of organizations and individuals sit on committees that provide guidance for where the state uh, puts its efforts and money in acquiring lands, including forest preserve. Um, <clears throat> a year later, there was a dedicated annual fund set up uh, to acquire land, the, the Environmental Protection Fund. And then shortly thereafter, yet another bond act, um, this one in 1996, um, and some key acquisitions, including one other big, large one, 5,000 acres uh, from the Lundy estate outside of Ellenville, which straddled the Catskill Park boundary. So the lands that were inside the park became forest preserve, and the lands that were outside the park became a state forest. There's a picture of that property in yellow. Um, and this is an example of how the state um, no longer did things solely on its own, but also relied on the help of nonprofit land conservation organizations. So in this case of the Lundy State, it was the Open Space Institute, which acquired all that land and then conveyed it to the state. And there have been many, many examples, an increasing number of examples um, over the past few decades of nonprofit conservation organizations assisting in acquisition of lands for eventual conveyance to additions to the public land units. Um, another example is that one I mentioned earlier where the Catskill Center conveyed 3,600 acres in the headwaters of the Beaverkill River. Uh, that's in red here. So you can see how kind of integral it was to the surrounding wilderness areas. Um, sometimes it's not huge pieces of land, but a very important small piece that's strategically located. You know, here's Fawn's Leap and the Catterskill Clove and uh, another smaller parcel um, that the Catskill Center helped to convey to the state. Um, <clears throat> in 1999, um, oops, sorry. Um, oops, sorry. <laughs> having trouble with the slide here. 1999, uh, the state issued a Casco Park uh, public access plan, which had some really good recommendations, but unfortunately was never funded. Um, but in that plan, um, they wanted to uh, put emphasis on building a Casco Interpretive Center, which the idea for that had been around for quite a few years, but was not gaining much traction or funding. And so they were promoting that. They wanted um, aesthetic guidelines. Uh, you you kind of know that most of you know when you go to the Adirondacks, you you really know when you enter the park. All the, the signs change from green and white at the road intersections and road signs to brown and yellow or brown and white. All the guardrails are brown. And that some of that was in the Catskills, but it was sort of a hodgepodge and not very consistent. And the idea was to to bring that into more consistency. Um, the plan called for better kiosks and information sources for hikers and other visitors, better trails uh, for opportunities for people with disabilities, better linkages between trails. Um, and it also called for a Casco coordinator position because the Casco Park falls into two DEC regions, region three out of New Paltz, region four out of Schenectady and Stanford. Um, and they wanted a person that could kind of straddle the two regions and be focused just on the park. Um, that did not occur, uh, but I will mention later that eventually it did. Um, in 2003, um, the state proposed revising that old 19, 85 Casco Park State Land Master Plan. 
and a draft was released that created um, some new proposals. Uh, they were going to establish a new wilderness area in the Blackhead Range and expand another wilderness area. They wanted to repeal what was called the 2700 foot rule, which was basically stating that any lands above 2700 foot elevation in a wild forest would be treated as if it were a wilderness. Um, that's kind of good in theory, but it was very hard to enforce um, because those elevations were not marked in any way on trails or on the ground. And there were exceptions where snowmobile trails were already in place above that line and other reasons. Um, but they did want to limit uh, snowmobile trails um, in high elevations. They wanted to limit maximum group camping sizes and they wanted to limit mountain biking. That became incredibly controversial, um, was sort of an unexpected um, reaction that the state didn't uh, expect. And um, it delayed the adoption of a new Casco Park state land master plan. Um, in 2004 was the 100 year anniversary of the Casco Park, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Um, a lot of things um, happened. Um, to commemorate that anniversary, um, reflecting the hard work of so many people and groups. Um, simple things such as creating a website and planning hikes and events um, to more uh, costly things like new entrance signs for the park, um, updating maps and guides for the public. Um, we had... Um, you know, lots of articles and media coverage um, to, to bring the attention to the park, to the public. Um, and then there were some, some big initiatives like the book that I already mentioned, um, and also the formation of the Catskill Mountain Club, a brand new hiking club uh, kind of of and for the Catskills. Um, the Catskill Mountain Club is still going today, um, which I'm happy to report. They're very strong. If you're a hiker, I encourage you to check them out. Um, so back in 2004, one of the first things the Casco Mountain Club did was partner with the DEC to create uh, and the Casco Center and other groups um, like the New York New Jersey Trail Conference. There was several groups involved to create the Lark in the Park, um, which was modeled after the Hudson River Ramble. And so for a period of 10 days or so in October, from October 1st through Columbus Day, um, there would be a whole series of guided hikes, paddles, and other events uh, around the Casco Park, and that's also still going on. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So uh, since the Casco Park um, anniversary, so much has, has happened. This is, there's been no stagnation in um, the attention and energies paid to the Catskill Park uh, in the last 18 years um, since I worked on the book and uh, since I worked at the Catskill Center. In 2008, that Catskill Park State Land Master Plan that I mentioned was finally uh, revised and finalized and adopted. Um, and it included a lot of new opportunities for the mountain bike community. Um, as I mentioned, uh, that mountain biking resource grew over a period of years. Um, and not only were there certain trails in the um, existing forest preserve lands that were open to mountain biking, but a whole host of mountain bike trails um, multiple use trails, but focused on mountain bike use were created, especially at Elm Ridge Wild Forest. And then uh, at later dates, they expanded to the Bluestone Wild Forest. So that's a, a great new resource uh, for people that like to enjoy that activity. Um, in 2012, um, the Casco Center for Conservation and Development uh, formed a Casco Park Advisory Committee. And then just a year later, that kind of grew uh, to also include a coalition of many groups called the Casco Park Coalition. I believe it started out with a handful of groups and then has now grown to uh, at least a couple dozen, if not more. Um, they began a Casco Park Awareness Day um, 
and uh, it's I think now it might just be Casco Park Day, but um, it's it's a day where um, groups and individuals like the Casco Center and the Casco Mountain Club can call attention to Casco Park issues in Albany um, with the governor and legislatures and the public just to get people focused on Casco Park uh, awareness issues, challenges, resources. Um, in 2014, ground was finally broken on the Catskill, what was originally called the Catskill Interpreter Center and is now known as the Catskill Visitor Center on Route 28 in Mount Tremper. And then it was opened in, 2000, in 2015. Uh, it's an incredible resource for people coming into the area to pick up um, maps, ask questions, learn about the region, buy books. Um, and uh, it's just fantastic for, uh, for there to be a spot where people can be oriented to the Catskill Park. Because um, like I said before, there is no entrance booth. You know, you don't get to the park entrance, pay your $5 and get a map. You have to kind of learn ahead of time what the Catskill Park and Forest Preserve is all about. And this is a great place to do that. Um, in uh, 2020 to 2023, there was a strategic planning advisory group um, that really looked carefully at some of the challenges um, that the Casco Park is facing in sustainable outdoor recreation. Um, visitation to the Cascals has always been high on, you know, nice summer days. Certain trailheads would always be busy. Catterskill Falls. <laughs> was never a place where you could have, have find solace, um, but the uh, level of that congestion and use really increased dramatically um, during and after uh, COVID um, and it remains a challenge um, how to um, educate and manage uh, an increasing number of people visiting. Um, in 2021, uh, the Casco Park coordinator position was finally established by New York State DEC. So there's now a dedicated individual, McCray Burnham, uh, whose focus is the Catskill Park and its, and its issues and how to make it a better place. Um, at various times over the past 18 years, um, more state funding for the Catskill Park. It's always um, a drumbeat of organizations like the Catskill Center and the Catskill Mountain Keeper and the Catskill Mountain Club, you know, to the state keep funding the Catskills and the Catskill Park. Um, and just this past fall, we had a new Bond Act passed, which I'm sure will generate money for the Catskills. Um, more forest lands have been acquired, uh, including, you know, Bel Air Ridge and the base of Overlook Mountain, Tysonic Mountain, more lands around the Bluestone Wild Forest, um, and many new trails. Um, I thought I'd hiked a lot of the trails when I lived in the Catskills, but now I'm way behind again. They keep building more. Um, so there's a fantastic rail trail now along the Shokan Reservoir and into Boysville. Um, there's big extensions along the Phoenicia East Branch Trail and the Warner Creek Trail was constructed, the new trail, the Red Hill Fire Tower, among others. Um, so just a, just a quick aside now to kind of show you how the Catskill Park overlaps with the New York City watershed. Um, you can see this overlapping area in green on this map, the watershed's in pink. Catskill Park's in blue, the overlapping areas in green, the overlapping areas around 450,000 acres, and 65% uh, of the Catskill Park is in the watershed, 45% of the watershed is in the park, and um, part of the reason the water is so incredible in these reservoirs is because 72% of the Catskill Forest Preserve lands lie within the watershed, not to mention all the lands that New York City has acquired themselves. Um, I also wanted to throw up this slide um, of data from Mike Kudish, who is a, a gem of a person. He's been studying the Casco Forest for many, many decades. And um, this map is probably no longer accurate. He keeps adding data, refining his data. Um, but this was a snapshot of the first growth forest stands um, from as it stood back in 2004. And um, it shows the best guess as to where the forests never were cut down. These are the, the places where the virgin timber survived um, and the old growth uh, escaped 
the saws. And there are around 65,000 acres of first growth in the Catskills, or at least that was the rough estimate um, 18 years ago. Um, the Catskill Park beauty in both the human and the natural elements. I think these pictures kind of say it all. It's a gentle balance of people and nature. Um, it's, as I mentioned, the wilderness lost, the wilderness recovering, people out enjoying the mountains, high quality um, streams and, and high quality habitats, recreation for everyone. Um, and this is my last slide, uh, just some photo credits to the people and groups that provided images that I used in this presentation, and just some uh, shots to remember, you know, why this is all important and why we care. Um, I apologize for going well over my 45 minutes, Donna. <laughs> That's okay, Chris. It was really super interesting. I learned so much. Uh, does anybody have any questions? can just unmute yourself and ask. <laughs> well, Chris, I want to say thank you very much. That was a perfectly wonderful overview of what's been happening over the last hundred plus years. The only thing I have to say is I live on Tice Tonight Mountain and that acquisition came from our family. Yes. <laughs> but you misspelled the name of the mountain. Oh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> to be honest with you, I couldn't remember. And so I went on Google and that was what came up on the trails websites. <laughs> the topo maps are old and they have not been revised for a number of years. But it's named after Matthias and his nickname was Tice. So it's a good Dutch name, T-E-N-E-Y-C-K. Thank you. I will correct that spelling if I ever give this presentation again. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have any other questions, comments? Is there a place that we could go to get the information, especially the later stuff? Um, there's um, there's quite a bit for, do you mean information about some of the plans that guide the park or just uh, hiking maps? What type of information are you interested in? I guess to protect it. My, my interest is to protect protect everything that's going on, especially at this point um, where there's a lot of talk in the area, I guess, about building in New York State, that they want to build, um, build housing um, yeah. complexes for New yeah. York State. Uh, I, housing is, is one, there's, there's many um, challenges and potential threats in the future. To, yes. um, to the region, not just the Catskill Park, but the whole region. Um, uh, proper siting of renewable energy, uh, climate change. Um, you know, there's many things flooding from climate change. There's many things that can, um, you know, also the spread of non-native invasive species. <laughs> so there's there's a lot of things that can degrade um, the quality of, of what we know now. Yes. Um, my best advice is to lend your support to the really great organizations that care about the region. Um, some of those include the Catskill Center for Conservation and Development, Catskill Mountain Keeper, and the Catskill Mountain Club. Um, those are all worthy of your membership and a few donor dollars. Um, I would certainly put in a plug for that. And also, you know, make your voice known um, to your political representatives telling them to support the DEC as they try to manage these lands that they own. Um, there are really great people that uh, are in charge of stewarding the lands that are in public ownership. Um, you know, in my day, I had wonderful partnerships with um, Bill Rudge and Jeff Ryder in Region 3 and Frank Parks in Region 4. 
Um, and, and there's, there's foresters who, who devote their whole careers to um, proper management of the Catskill Park. And so they, they need support from Albany. And that sometimes uh, comes from uh, lobbying your political representatives to keep the state properly funded. <laughs> 